entry one. The scientists had no explanation for it, nor did they have a plan. But as our little society on Pacifica Island gathered at the pier to witness the miracle, we could all agree on one thing. It's beautiful, Susie said. She wrapped her hand around her husband, Scott. Yeah, it is, Scott said, and he wrapped his hand around Susie's back. I thought they were a little young to be married, but truth be told, I wish I had someone to put my arm around. Even in that vast crowd of fishermen, cooks, stock workers, stock brokers, tourists, drug dealers, and cops, there was no one for me to hang on to. Only my brother Reggie walked away in the insane asylum. So, uh, what is it? I asked. I don't know, Scott said. And that's all there was to say. Our eyes remained fixed on the hole above, no work done that day and nobody to notice. For that one day, our whole island culture stood together, staring at the sky until sundown. And it looked like a dark inverted sphere, floating just under the sun with purple rays pulsing from the center and then fading off into the clear Pacific sky. But it was closer than the sun, the sun, this miracle that was just within our reach had we the wings to do so. And at first, we wanted to. It was inescapable. There was not a single vantage point on Pacifica Island. No luxury condo, no coconut shack, no volcano, where this vast void did not stare down on you. And despite Pacifica's clear night sky, that void was still prominent within the darkness. Darkness is something, and the heart of this miracle is nothing. And that should have been our first clue. By the next morning, we gave it a name. We had to classify it and impose some kind of ownership on the nothing. We had to do this so Scott and Susie could run their preschool, so I could go and cook for my clients and visit Reggie in the mental ward, so the sailors could gut their blue fence and the tourists could buy stock on their phones. So, like most things, it was named by appearance. And nothing was now the black hole. And because we still thought of the black hole as nothing, we didn't realize the truth. Our miracle was the end of the world. If you're even around to hear the words on this cheap audio recorder, to understand the language I speak, then you know how we died. That's not why I'm doing this. I'm recording this because I need to tell you about how my brother Reggie died. Entry 2. It had been a week and things had changed. The black hole's hunger began gradually. We marveled as the small things floated first. An appetizer of weak plants, cicadas, grasshoppers, tin cans and bottles, cancer meds and Vicodin all spiraling toward it like a little galaxy and the constant dull pull that left our hair waving and our Hawaiian shirts rippling. It was still a wonder then, though an increasingly disconcerting one. The panic was still gestating, waiting in the backs of our minds, while we waited for an answer, anything from the outside world, to let us know it's going to be okay. But it was in that first week that Scott insisted Susie stay home from the preschool. She didn't, but most parents kept their children home anyway. And Reggie was safely trapped inside the institution. So Scott and I continued our morning routine, which was sitting down on the pier, sharing our hand-rolled cigarettes, watching the calm world of Pacifica slowly lift. We'd never smoke our own. I'd roll one for him, and he'd do the same for me. We talked about the old times, riding bikes and waves, diving for clams, and making scandalous teenage trips to the mainland to go skirt chasing. Yet, our eyes had left that blue horizon and were now fixed solely on the black hole. Entry three. The second week, society descended rapidly. The smaller the things we lost, the stronger the black hole became. Larger things ascended. And they didn't just go rocketing into the abyss. They'd float, 
an inch or so above the pavement and sand. And as we lost hold on the smaller things, it seemed natural that the larger things would slip as well. Yet it never quite followed a clear pattern. And it'd always be an odd pushcart floating, or even a tree. Our desperate communal attempt to fix logic on this black hole was constantly subverted. First it was cats and dogs, but now it was also steel street lamps slowly wavering in the pole, and telephone wires dancing as if in a storm, and seagulls struggling above. The people walked aimlessly below. The cops didn't notice all the pierced thugs pissing in the streets. The parents' hands clasped to their children's like handcuffs. But the unspoken panic took over so subtly that we hardly noticed. And it was then that I dug up this old voice recorder and felt the need to leave something behind. For some, it was a diary buried deep in the soil. For others, it was their apocalyptic graffiti. For me, it's this audio log, chained to the steel foundation of my basement, chained to cinder blocks, chained to a bench press covered in dust. And we clung to anything. I clung to my job, Susie clung to Scott, and Scott and I clung to our peer routine. So how's business? People still hiring private chefs and all this weirdness? Scott asked. Yeah, actually, it's greater than ever. <laughs> now, I don't want to brag, but I was the greatest chef Pacifica Island had ever seen. I never had to work in a restaurant, always hired as a private chef by the tourists, though I did always volunteer in soup kitchens. My skills were hampered only by my client's creativity. Fried flies stuffed in a turkey, stuffed in a swordfish, draped with syrup slathered spinach. Sure. My reputation rested on my urban crusted Chilean sea bass, stuffed with Scandinavian mussels and snail entrails, draped with caramelized onions, and served on a bed of elk fillet. I called it the engorger. In those final days, everyone wanted something special. Some wanted the engorger. But some had very strange, very specific tastes. Honey dipped raw lobster, clam cakes with barbecued stallion liver. If they could get the supplies, I could handle it, no matter how strange it got. And believe me, it got strange. I passed the cigarette to Scott. How about you and Susie? Susie's preschool's empty. You know, for the first time, I'm kind of glad we don't have any kids. I looked at him and noticed his face was sunburned. No more daily sunscreen. No one wore it anymore. There was no need to. But it was hot as hell, and Scott still shivered. I blew a smoke ring and marveled at how quickly the black hole wisped it away. So how's Reggie doing? No change, I said. Still no answer. Sorry, bro, I don't think you're going to get one. Doesn't mean I'm going to stop asking. Reggie cut his wrists a year ago. And I don't mean teenage girl just got dumped cuts. I mean huge, jagged, lightning bolt cuts carved deep from wrist to elbow. Now, I'm no doctor, but I can see how maybe you could do that to one arm. But how the hell do you use that mangled arm to then rip open the other one? It was like Zeus himself tore my brother's forearms apart. So a year ago, I come home an hour early, sick of sautéing shrimp eyes, and find my genetic twin lying in a deep brown pool. It was instinct. Call the paramedics. Save him. I never bothered to ask his opinion. I didn't think about what he wanted, or about what pushed him that far. Maybe he wasn't making a mistake. Maybe he had a reason. Maybe it was his choice to make, and maybe, just maybe, my need to chain him here was wrong. And I still haven't got an answer because I can't. I ask, but Reggie died that night, though I still visit him at St. Pacifica Mental Health and Wellness Center, where his body walks aimlessly in circles, his eyes white and glazed over, and his veins pumped with meds, and so many other meds to counteract those meds, and meds to counteract the side effects of those meds, and on and on and on. There's no Reggie in there anymore. He 
got no mom, <clears throat> no dad, no one else to visit him. But every time I ask, why, why, Reggie, why did you do this to yourself, I get no answer because I'm not asking Reggie anything. I'm asking a moving piece of meat, something I could grill and serve it away. Thank you.